I'd like to introduce our speaker. He's an associate professor in the Program of Science, Technology, and Society, and a lecturer in MIT's Department of Physics here on campus. Um, completed uh, his AB in Physics at Dartmouth and two PhDs, count them, in Physics and in the History of Science at Harvard University. Um, his most recent work is called How the Hippies Saved Physics, a recent publication, and uh, is uh, features some of the research of his research on the development of physics in the United States in the Cold War period. Um, on the physics side, he looks at early universe cosmology, working at the interface of particle physics and gravitation. So a wonderful mix of topics that we hope to hear about tonight from MIT professor David Kaiser. Please give me a round of applause. <laughs> joining, welcome in. Thanks. We'll switch over. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You can hear me okay? Is the mic okay? Great. Well, I'm so pleased to see what a, what a marvelous turnout on a, on a rainy day. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, once we get the first slide up. Uh, a, a very small um, correction to the introduction. The book is actually not out yet, so don't go rushing to buy it. Uh, you can't even pre-order it yet, but it is in progress. Hopefully, it'll be out within the year. Uh, so I do want to talk to you about, about this book project uh, with this, uh, I hope, catchy title called How the Hippies Save Physics. Uh, I'm going to start with some actually very recent developments, pretty recent information, recent for an historian at the very least, uh, going back just a couple of years. Uh, the, some press releases from April of 2004, just a few years ago, or indeed from October of uh, 2007, not so long ago. These are press releases about what I consider quite extraordinary real-world uh, tests, real-world experiments that were done in one case in Vienna, the other one in Geneva, similar tests going on right here in Kendall Square and throughout the world at this point. They're in, in this, uh, on this topic called quantum encryption. Sounds like James Bond. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that uh, over the course of the evening. The, the, the idea in brief is that some physicists and engineers can now uh, harness special pairs of beams of light, special specially prepared photons, little particles of light and use them to send uh, encrypted messages. And they're encrypted not just because it's really hard as a practical matter for computers to break them down into small factors the way we usually handle encryption for emails or internet commerce today. They're protected, as we'll learn, by the laws of physics. Right? These really, really are protected, not just as a practical matter. And so in one of the earliest instances, a group uh, based in Vienna uh, worked with the local, a local bank and the uh, mayor of the city to have an electronic bank wire, a, tr a money wire, a transfer from the uh, city hall to the bank or vice versa, I actually can't remember which, uh, and it was using these specially prepared beams of light. Uh, if someone had tried to eavesdrop on that signal, it would have basically destroyed the information so that neither the eavesdropper nor anyone else could get it. Uh, moreover, the eavesdropping would be uh, very quickly and readily um, detectable. You'd know if you were being listened to, and the eavesdropper would get only random noise at the end. And with those safeguards in place, uh, this was real dirty work. They had grad students stringing fiber optic cables to the sewers. That's how you know it was serious. Uh, the money wire went through without a hitch. About three years later, two and a half years later, a uh, similar uh, uh, real world uh, demonstration in Geneva with um, uh, electronic voting. So they were, they were sort of ca cantonal or sort of like county wide uh, elections. Uh, and the votes were sent into the central computer protected by the same basic idea as quantum cryptography. So these are ideas that are quite extraordinary beyond uh, only the scratch pads of our theorists. People are actually building uh, prototypes of these even to this day. What I want to do for this talk is say, how do we get to a world like that? How do we get to a world uh, where quantum encryption could actually be something real, where billions of dollars now are invested uh, in research and development around the world, in the United States, in, in Japan, throughout Europe, and many other places? How do we get there? We're going to see that this field, often, which is part of something called quantum information science, sort of a cutting edge, very exciting area of physics today, uh, that, that's of kind of recent genesis. And in fact, the area from which that field had to come, people who worried very deeply about the foundations or interpretation of quantum theory, uh, that was really on the sidelines. We have what's here basically a Cinderella story. Uh, I borrowed the title, as you might have noticed, from a, a very well-known book it came out in the mid-90s uh, called How the Irish Saved Civilization. The title also, I think, is only a, only a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Maybe other people had a hand in it. Uh, but the, the uh, Thomas Cahill's argument here is quite simple to summarize. Basically, in Cahill's account, 
at the end of, the, of uh, the Roman Empire, as the sort of citadel of power and learning was literally beginning to crumble, uh, some enterprising young monks ferreted out the intellectual riches of Greece and Rome, uh, as the Vandals and Visigoths and all the other Goths were about to storm the gates. Uh, these monks, uh, basically under their robes, right, stole or, or took with them the, the accumulated learning to the hinterlands, to, to the Emerald Isle. They escaped to Ireland, and they sort of nursed this flame of learning while uh, most of the continent slid into what's often called the Dark Ages, or certainly the Middle Ages. So we have these people pushed to the margins who are kind of uh, uh, paying attention to questions and kind of nursing along a tradition of learning until the continent is able to absorb these things again, and then we more or less get the Renaissance. Uh, Cahill fills that with a few more details. That's the basic idea. Uh, he's no dummy. He released the book on St. Patrick's Day. He knew his audience. What I, I, there, I'm not going to endorse this view of Western Civ. I, I do, however, like this model, this image he has in mind, this kind of circulation. We have a, a kind of reigning system, uh, which had been incredibly successful at what it was doing, the sort of dominant way of doing things, including in, in intellectual life, uh, starting to fray, starting to fall apart under pressures internal and external. And we have some people who we might charitably call misfits or unusuals or fringe types who, uh, who kind of take those things to the sidelines and nurse them along until, if you'd like, the mainstream is ready for them again. It's that kind of model that I have in mind uh, for, some, for some of the hippies at the center of this story. Now, I'm not talking about the, the Roman Empire, at least not directly. I am talking about uh, sort of traditions for doing really, really good physics research in the United States uh, in the years after World War II. We might think of this as the, the, the sort of major Cold War era. Shown here in blue is a, a curve I spend an awful lot of time uh, staring at, I stared at it too often. This is plotting the number of PhDs in physics granted in the United States over time. Uh, and you can see some, some, some interesting patterns here. World War II ends right here, and we see explosive skyrocketing growth in physics uh, training after World War II. That happens to be true in, in many places, uh, not just in the United States. It happens to be fastest. Uh, rates of growth were fastest in the United States. It turns out every other field in the academy was growing exponentially after World War II in the United States. History PhDs were, were growing exponentially. Economics, literature, religious studies. The exponent was bigger for physics. And those of you who remember some of your high school mathematics or more, uh, a small change in exponent can, can lead to large changes in outcomes. So in fact, the exponent for physics was twice as big as almost any other field. So they're all growing exponentially. Physics is just roaring ahead in enrollments. Similar kind of growth in the years after Sputnik, as the Cold War again kind of um, uh, hardens further. Uh, and what's often forgotten is this tumultuous fall starting around roughly 1970. It's in fact eerily symmetrical, the rise and fall, post Sputnik and then uh, post, say, roughly 1970. The decline was as, uh, as sharp, the, the rate of descent was unfortunately as precipitous as the post Sputnik rise had been. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into this falling part. This, for me, is going to play the role of that crumbling Colosseum. This is the Roman Empire in its, in its last moments here. Uh, is we're going to see what's it like to, do, to, to become a young physicist in that era. Not in this boom time of expansion, but in that bust. If you think you've seen that curve before you have, we're living with one now. Here's the NASDAQ. Uh, this is actually an old slide. This is pre-Bernie Madoff, Goldman Sachs, et cetera. Uh, but we see phenomena like this all the time. Right? This is akin to a kind of speculative bubble. It was bid up with earnestness and, and uh, with great intentions, and also, in many cases, sort of unbridled hype. And it was a house of cards that, in the end, was not sustainable. Another quick indication, uh, these numbers always, uh, I think, are useful to keep in mind. The American Institute of Physics, which is the sort of overall governing professional body for, for physicists in the United States, um, they would maintain a kind of uh, clearinghouse, a placement registry for young physicists who are looking for jobs and employers who are looking to hire young physicists. They would often arrange interviews at the annual meetings and so on. They also, for a while, kept logs, how many people had come to them looking for a job or looking to hire a young physicist. It was a really, if you could build a time machine, then you should be giving this lecture. But if you could build a time machine, uh, then I would, and you want to do physics, I would advise you to set your clock for something around 1963 or, or earlier. Those were, at least if you want to get a job, <laughs> those are pretty good times. The, it, even during this exponential increase in numbers of physics students, you'd think flooding the market, there was a glut of people. In fact, there were more employers seeking, seeking to hire physicists than these exponentially rising numbers of physicists. Demand outstripped supply, even as supply grew exponentially. 
Uh, that's a good time to be a young student. Uh, by the late 60s, the balance had tipped. I'm not sure you can see those numbers now. There were close to 1,000 students registered with only 250 or so employers looking for jobs. And then the bottom fell out. This is what's known as a bubble that bursts, right? So with, by 1971, there were more than 1,000 students clamoring for 53 posted positions in the entire United States, at least the ones who went through the AIP to do their hiring. Uh, that's what it means to fall off a cliff. And so it's in that moment of really quite extreme change in, if you like, the environment, the world in which young physicists were growing up, that's the kind of backdrop uh, against which the rest of the story is going to play out. So I'm going to talk today about three, three main sort of moments uh, in this 1970s um, period of transition. Uh, some new topics that return to attention among at least some uh, numbers of physicists. Uh, new places, new institutions in which that work would be catered, would, would be encouraged. Uh, and then finally, one example of how I think this has a kind of lasting um, impact even to this day. We'll talk about a book some of you might know uh, I read as a high school student and quite enjoyed called The Tao of Physics, an example of a, of a wider trend. That's where we're going. The focus for tonight is this group called the Fundamental Physics Group. They were playful. Either they couldn't spell because they were physics students or they were just being playful. They spelled physics with an F. Could have been both. Uh, these were, this was a group of approximately 10 students, about 10 core members, uh, and then others would join over time. Uh, the group shared many characteristics. Almost all of them had gotten PhDs in physics from very elite programs from Columbia and Stanford and Berkeley and University of Illinois uh, and UCLA, really top programs. Uh, and they happened to get PhDs at the wrong time, right? The right place at the wrong time, or wrong place at the right time. They were, they were finishing their degrees more or less just as that bubble was bursting, when it was hardest of, of any time in the 20th century to get a job as a physicist. Uh, that's when they happened to be finishing up. One way or another, and uh, to make a long story short, they kind of make their way to Berkeley. You might say in the early 70s, where else would you go? You're out of work anyway. So they go to Berkeley, and they kind of find each other. Two of these students, uh, folks, were actually still grad students at Berkeley, uh, and so they, had, they, they could sort of, um, they were officially enrolled. They could sign up a large conference room at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, where they were doing their work. That's a national laboratory nestled in the hills uh, in Berkeley, just sort of above the campus, uh, a major facility. And so they, because they were kind of registered students, they could sign up a seminar room for Friday afternoons each week. Uh, and that's where they and then their, their, their friends would meet for very informal discussions. It turns out during that ramping up phase, during that the sort of Sputnik era uh, of rapid exponential growth in the American physics community, uh, most physicists spent less and less time on what we might call philosophy or interpretation of quantum mechanics. The great who had designed quantum theory in the early years uh, of the 20th century had, in their mind, beaten their head against some very juicy philosophical nuggets, things that you've probably heard about to this day, like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the role of probabilities or wave-particle duality. I mean, these are juicy topics. They would often, people like Heisenberg or Niels Bohr or even Albert Einstein, they would beat their heads against this by quoting the works of Immanuel Kant as well as of Erwin Schrodinger. For them, this was inherently a philosophical project. Some of them would, would go further afield. Wolfgang Pauli became very close with the uh, depth psychologist Carl Jung, very, became very sort of mystically inclined. Schrodinger would read and quote from the, uh, uh, the Hindu scriptures. I mean, they thought this, we have to figure out what it means to think, not just what it means to calculate wave functions in the, in the era of quantum theory. That kind of engagement, rightly or wrongly, that kind of engagement slipped out of the curricula very dramatically uh, during the years after World War II, for a host of reasons we can talk about if you'd like. So these people who were being trained in this post-Sputnik boom were getting almost none of that, at least in their formal schooling. Some of them had read popular books, and they, got, they thought physics was all about these big philosophical questions, and they felt very frustrated by their formal training. And then they couldn't get jobs anyway. They said, well, if we have time on our hands, we have these big sort of metaphysical, juicy questions that's, that they haven't been satisfactorily answered. They figured that's what they spend their time on. Some of them got kind of day jobs, but then would work with this group uh, in, the, in the off hours. And so that's where, that's where the fundamental comes from. They want to understand the fundamental interpretation of things like Schrodinger's equation or Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, and uh, so they gathered just as, as his bottom fell out. And as one of the founding members uh, told me recently, Elizabeth Rauscher, who was one of the grad students at Berkeley, she said they realized it would be easier to learn about all this material if we got together for informal discussions and lectures. And that's how this group, this very playful informal group called the Fundamental Physics Group was born. They spent a lot of their time, in fact, the majority of their time, worrying about one particular new development 
uh, in quantum theory. It's now known as Bell's theorem, or entanglement is a word that's often used for it. Uh, Einstein uh, had some notion that this might be uh, a feature of quantum theory, and he hated it, right? It's not that anyone liked this thing. Uh, Bohr and Schrodinger had, had, had hinted towards that this might be, be playing a role at the heart of quantum theory. Einstein said, if so, then so much the worse for quantum theory. You fools have got to go back to the drawing board. Einstein called this spooky actions at a distance. That was not meant to be terms of praise. So what's going on here? Uh, the idea, as, as uh, the, the, uh, the Irish physicist who was then working at CERN, John Bell, came back to this in the mid-1960s. Uh, and to, to make a long story short, the idea was that when you study specially prepared pairs of quantum objects, these might be uh, those special beams of light, like in the, the experiments I mentioned in the beginning, they could be electrons. You have a specially prepared pair in something called an entangled state. Let's say one of those particles shoots off towards a, a detector over here. Maybe it'll measure its uh, spin or some inherent property. Its, its cousin, its twin, heads off to another detector. And what Bell realized was that inherent to the formalism of quantum theory, one couldn't seem to get away from it if one wanted to keep the, the basic elements of quantum theory, that the decision to measure something over here, maybe I'll measure the property in this uh, setting the detector or this one, whatever I choose, that would instantaneously, at least according to uh, their understanding of quantum theory, that would instantaneously affect the properties that one could ascribe to particle B. And now Bell, like any good physicist, said, now let's take this to, to uh, absurdum. Let's say these two detectors aren't across the room, but are across the galaxy. Maybe they're across the universe. How could it be, said Bell, indeed as Einstein had worried as well, how could it be that something that I choose to measure over here can instantaneously, across arbitrary distances, affect my description of that part of the system over there? That sounds like action at distance, which again, the physicist is, is, those are fighting words. You don't want to talk about that. Uh, some thought it sounded like telepathy. Either way, it sounded like the whole was more than the sum of its parts. This entire quantum system, the pair of particles, was somehow, uh, had to be treated as one unisolatable system. We couldn't break it down into subunits and, isolate, and, and analyze each one separately. In fact, we had to take the whole thing, even if its parts were ridiculously far apart. So that notion became known as entanglement, or non-locality, or more broadly, Bell's theorem. Bell uh, uh, wrote an incredibly elegant article laying this out, showing that this is, is inescapable if one otherwise believes quantum theory. Uh, the article was published to no great fanfare in 1964. Uh, but that's what this group, the fundamental physics group, spent most of their time beating their heads against. You can imagine, this, is, this sounds like the juicy, deep philosophical question they were kind of hungry for. What could it mean about the world for this to be true? It's, it's one thing, and it's a very important thing, to learn how to do very hard calculations and match data and experiments, and that's, that's one way to train physicists that's quite important. Another one, so this group felt, was to say, what could this mean about the world with actually relatively simple calculations? To say, what does it mean if quantum theory insists upon this? So today, Bell's theorem, that article that I just mentioned from 1964, is, is uh, what's called in technical terms, renowned. Physicists love counting things, you might have noticed. Among, we love to count citations, both self-citations and citations to other people. Uh, my wife, who's a psychologist, has all kinds of theories about this. In any case, uh, any way you slice or dice it, Bell's theorem is among the most cited articles since the Earth has cooled. I don't mean since Newton, I mean ever, ever, ever. It's, in, uh, it's uh, in the top 0.01% of most cited articles of any topic in physics at any era, uh, which they roughly one in every 10,000 articles has been cited a comparable number of times. That's a lot, right? That's pretty good. Uh, it took a long time to get there. What I show here in this blue curve now are the number of citations worldwide, globally, in the physics literature to Bell's uh, now, as we see, uh, remarkable and renowned article. You see the scale here is tens. You don't get to, to 10,000 citations quickly if you have to go 10 per year, or even sometimes one per year. That one, in fact, being self-citation by John Bell himself. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get to 10,000 fast in units of ones or tens. Right, so, so this, this renowned uh, element central to things like these breakthroughs in Vienna and Geneva that I mentioned before, central to quantum encryption, was not uh, heralded upon I initial publication, to put it mildly. And in fact, public uh, citations to it, any sort of activity, anyone seeming to pay any notice at all among uh, working physicists, really only starts to kind of gel, in, uh, I even in a modest way, in the mid uh, and late 1970s. And then it takes off after that, too, we can talk about. Let's take this first, uh, let's see, 15-year run during which there are about 160 citations worldwide. That would still be perfectly acceptable, respectable, uh, though uh, obviously a mere shadow of what was to come. During that first period, three quarters of the articles 
that were doing this citing, at least the ones that were written by uh, physicists based in the US, three quarters of those came from this very strange little group I mentioned, the fundamental physics group, this group that was holed up in Berkeley and otherwise most of whom couldn't get regular jobs, regular physics jobs. So three quarters, and then if you actually read the articles, which is sort of fun, not just count them, uh, you see the proportion rises to nearly 90% of those doing the citing. If you include authors in that group or people who thank the members of that group in their own acknowledgments. These are what's known as the early adopters right, of Bell's theorem, worldwide and certainly uh, over-represented over among physicists in the United States. So the group is spending an enormous amount of time worrying about Bell's theorem, which today many of us worry about all the time. It's quite fascinating. Now, they were worried about that for all kinds of reasons. Uh, they were, as I mentioned, exceedingly well-trained physicists, very smart, very curious, sort of broadly philosophically curious. And as I mentioned, they were sitting in the middle of the San Francisco Bay Area in the mid-70s, early in mid-70s. Uh, and some of you may know from experience or from reading, lots of stuff was going on in the Bay Area in the early mid-70s, lots of stuff being the technical term. So one of the things that these folks wanted to do was use quantum theory, especially Bell's theorem, this entanglement or non-locality, to explain uh, parapsychology, uh, which is often called psi, which is very convenient because we physicists use the Greek letter psi for the wave function in quantum theory. So they want to go from quantum theory to the occult, uh, and they think you can do that in one short step. As I mentioned before, trying to describe what Bell's theorem seems to imply, trying to use words about how particle A might somehow be tethered or connected to particle B, that starts to sound kind of like action at a distance or perhaps even telepathy. These physicists say it doesn't just sound like telepathy, maybe that's a physical explanation for telepathy, right? Maybe these really are sort of signs or shades of one phenomenon. So they're worried about things like ESP, extrasensory perception, uh, telepathy, precognition, or clairvoyance, receiving signals from the future, if not from the distant distance in space or perhaps distance in, in time. Something called remote viewing, we'll say more about in a moment. Psychokinesis, maybe you could actually move objects, not just receive signals from far away. This work was really uh, uh, jump-started in the Bay Area when this gentleman came to town. Some of you might recognize his name is Yuri Geller. He was an Israeli uh, stage magician who, uh, and, and sort of self-proclaimed psychic. He was whisked to the United States in the early 1970s. He was brought to the Stanford Research Institute. Uh, which until just before Geller arrived had been a formal part of Stanford University. It was something like uh, a, a sort of a very prestigious defense-oriented contract laboratory, research laboratory, something like Lincoln Laboratory or, or the instrumentation, the Draper Laboratory here. Yeah, until around 1970, it was formally uh, under the auspices of Stanford University. And during that turbulent time with the anti-war protests and so on, it was finally pushed off campus. Uh, students and faculty both at Stanford said uh, sort of classified research projects paid for by the Pentagon don't belong in the university. Similar debates uh, going on, of course, across the country, including here at MIT. So in 1970, SRI was spun off, and then their budget started to shrink just as much as everyone else's budget did. So they figured, great, we'll just survive on our defense contracts, and then their budget fell by approximately 30% in a very short amount of time. So there are people there who had time on their hands, including these two laser physicists, uh, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, uh, who had both been interested in all kinds of, we might say, mind-body connections. One of them had, for a time at least, been interested in Scientology, an interest that waxed and waned, but he was curious about unusual notions of mind-body connections. And when Geller was brought to town, they said, we'll test this fellow. We have interest in that kind of thing already. And so they set up what was known as the Psy Lab uh, at SRI. They ran hours and hours of tape. They wanted to check whether uh, Geller could, in fact, produce these psychic abilities under laboratory conditions. They were convinced he could. In fact, they got articles published in Nature, which is, say, the world's most prestigious scientific journal in any field, proceedings of the uh, Institute for Electrical Engineers. They get some very serious science papers published uh, claiming what they consider statistically significant results of ESP. They then start hiring my dropout hippie physicists, my, the ones I've been describing, uh, who are clustered in the area to be, if you'd like, their house theorists. Putoff and Targ were very smart and well-trained physicists, mostly experimentalists, and mostly worked on lasers and uh, quantum electronics. And these folks with PhDs in theoretical physics from elite programs who had their discussion group going, they became the people whose job it was to explain these things in first principles, to use quantum theory, to use Bell's theorem, to explain or at least account or at least make plausible what looked like a robust experimental results, like uh, including, though not limited, to Geller's uh, uh, results. So one of uh, the, the stars of that group, we'll hear more about in a moment, Jack Sarfati, uh, he began working closely with these things, uh, with these groups, 
He organized for follow-up tests of Geller in, uh, in the London laboratories. So we got very involved to make sure these results were replicable, like we think good science should be. And he starts releasing, uh, writing press releases to, to publicize these results. So one of them that he releases uh, after the first London tests says, the ambiguity in the interpretation of quantum mechanics leaves ample room for the possibility of psychokinetic and telepacket effects. What he's saying is, we all agree we don't know the final way to interpret quantum theory. It's weird and mysterious and has strange counterintuitive notions. We all agree on that. There's ambiguity, there's room for making sense of these things if, in fact, these are robust experimental results. He goes on in a separate press release, my personal professional judgment as a PhD physicist, <laughs> you know what that's worth, uh, is that Yuri Geller demonstrated genuine psychoenergetic ability. This is picked up by Science News, by many newspapers and magazines, in fact, internationally, throughout the United States in particular. Uh, and this is seen as very serious work, seen by some. Uh, this group, this fundamental physics group based in Berkeley, uh, plugged into SRI to Yuri Geller, trying to make sense of this, if you like, counterculture flowering. They become local celebrities, at least for a time. Here's a very playful photograph they took in 1975, just around that time. Here's Jack, whom I just quoted, uh, with his pals. This is Saul Paul Sarag, Fred Allen Wolf, and Nick Herbert in the background, kind of playing up their guru status. They were actually very, very smart and very playful. They had a very good time. Uh, around this time, the movie director Francis Ford Coppola had just bought the rights to uh, a kind of local magazine called City Magazine, the city of San Francisco. And one of the earliest features was a full photo feature spread on this group. Uh, and the, 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 the sort of breathless reporter was only too happy to say that these folks, Jack Sarfati and members of the fundamental physics group, were, quote, going into trances, working at telepathy, and dipping into their subconscious in experiments towards psychic mobility. What better proof that physicists have finally caught on to what's important in the world was, was the, the spin, at least, by that reporter. It's not only the kind of underground, counterculture, hippie, new age press in San Francisco, although there's plenty of that. Uh, you start getting uh, cover stories in Time Magazine for a moment, for a time at least, all the way to the New Hampshire Sunday News, all the way out here, and the AP wire picks up some of these stories. My personal favorite, of course, comes from We Magazine. I won't ask for a show of hands who's heard of that. It's not a publication of the French Embassy. It's actually a, it's a porno mag. This was, this was Playboy's answer uh, to, to Penthouse. <laughs> for historical reasons, I can go into the publication history of We Magazine. Now, as you might expect, MIT Library does not actually own these things, at least doesn't own them on the open stacks. I couldn't find them. So I did what anyone would do. I went to the internet and, and you know, bought a copy because I had to read this long feature article. And I told my wife, of course, I'm only reading it for the articles. So there's a long, <laughs> long, I mean, a very actually well-researched, well-reported article, several magazine pages on, uh, on this group and their efforts to understand quantum theory at its heart uh, and indeed to, if you'd like, apply it or use it to make sense of these very strange but sort of attention-grabbing phenomena that were going on. At the time, when that article came out in March of 79, that was one of the few places someone could go to read an in-depth account of these ongoing debates in the interpretation of quantum theory. Note to self. So how do you do this stuff? Let's move on to part two of the lecture. It's one thing to have new topics. Let's worry about, if you like, foundational matters in quantum theory as applied, we might say, broadly. Uh, how do you do that, right? These people weren't, for the most part, uh, academic physicists with steady jobs or tenure. They were really trying to make ends meet the hard way. One thing they do is they scare up some new patrons. Among them is the CIA. Now, that might sound curious. Uh, through things like the Freedom of Information Act, uh, many of us have learned over, over the years. I, I'm certainly not the first to, to note this. Many uh, uh, writers and journalists have found these things as well. That there was, in fact, a, a rather massive clandestine government effort in parapsychology to the tune of 25 or more million dollars that we've been able to track down so far uh, over uh, quite some time. How do you get money out of the Pentagon or the CIA during the Cold War? You say the Russians are doing more of it. Right? They were worried about a psi gap. Are the Russians building more missiles than us? Probably not. Are they getting better at mind reading? Oh, they might be. <laughs> uh, and so a uh, presto change of $25 million comes raining down from, from the, the sky. Uh, the, we are told the program was canceled in 95, though some of you might have seen the feature film The Men Who Stare at Goats. Uh, the, the writer who wrote that book has argued, I don't know independently, that these pro some of these programs were reactivated after 9-11. I don't know that for sure. But the point was uh, the CIA and then a branch within the Pentagon called the Defense Intelligence Agency, a kind of internal to Pentagon version of the CIA, uh, started funding handsomely what they called espionage, right? Use ESP to conduct espionage. Uh, and this is coming directly out of that SRI group for which most of these uh, theorists were the, were the house kind of interpreters. 
Uh, and so the idea was, uh, we can talk more about what they called remote viewing or espionage, but there were sort of, they went to be laboratory controlled experiments on whether one person could receive messages, visual input, or maybe even hear things or, or form some, receive some kind of message from a, from a remote uh, partner. Uh, in this case, one person would drive around the hills of, of San Francisco and stare very intently, say, at a park bench, while someone else in the control, right back in, in the home laboratory, would basically describe in real time what he or she saw or felt or heard. These things were transcribed, and we can talk more about the protocol. Uh, the, so um, the members of this uh, Berkeley discussion group, some of them were hired as paid consultants for this work, and then they did their own replication studies, uh, one of which was published here uh, that summer of uh, uh, 1975, I believe. So one of the ways you do this work is you get, you actually go to the, the regular old patrons, right? The federal government has been paying through the nose for physics, for basic physics research uh, since World War II and really, uh, well, that, that's, that was the Cold War model. Now these were different agencies within the federal government paying for different kinds of grant proposals. But in some sense, you know, you go to where you've gotten money before. What I find more interesting is that, in fact, th this group, this Berkeley group, became even, even more successful and even more creative in finding new patrons, actually quite original patrons, not like the CIA or the Pentagon. There are many in this, in this story, the one uh, who was most important sort of intellectually as well as financially, gave the most, is someone named Werner Erhard. Now, I don't know, if some, of, some of them I know have, have uh, heard of Werner. Uh, for others, it might be a name uh, forgotten. If I'd given this talk in 1980, we'd all know it in instantly who Erhard was. He was a, a phenomenal uh, center of media attention in the United States for, for really a decade and a half or more. Uh, he was born Jack Rosenberg. Uh, he went through a kind of transformation, uh, leaving his, his used car salesman job in Philadelphia, and he went to, uh, it's like the American dream. He became a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman in the Northwest, uh, and then finally came to the Bay Area, and he changed his name to Werner Erhardt. Um, the Werner came from Werner Heisenberg. He, was, he himself had been enamored of modern physics. He'd read popular books as a kid. He thought, that's the person I'd like to emulate. Uh, so he, in, in making up his new uh, alias, he already kind of uh, beckoned toward modern physics. And he founded what was called Erhard Seminars Training, or EST. And again, we would all have known all about that had this talk been uh, some years earlier. Uh, EST became exquisitely popular uh, in its day, and then maybe inevitably became somewhat controversial. The point is he was, by, by any measure, a self-made millionaire, highly successful, financially secure. He chose the name Werner for a reason. He was convinced on his own already that modern physics, including quantum theory, it must have something to say about what he called human potential. There must be some way to link quantum theory and consciousness or expand the basic powers that we have that are somehow occluded or locked up. This is often part of what we call the human potential movement. That included people like Earhart, in fact, many others throughout, especially California. And Earhart already had convinced himself from his popular reading, from his thinking about it, that these woolly ideas from uh, quantum theory must have some role to play. By chance, in a way I'd be happy to say, tell you more if you'd like, he happened to meet some of these members of what would become the fundamental physics group, people like Jack Sarfati and Fred Allen Wolf. They hit it off instantly, and, and very quickly, uh, Werner and his lawyers had set up, with formal filing of articles in corporation with the state of California, a not-for-profit uh, corporate entity called the Physics Consciousness Research Group. Uh, President Jack Sarfati, uh, Vice President Saul Paul Sarag, this, this is the same group uh, as that fundamental physics group. And so with that, where they're set up to, ha to funnel large amounts of funds, the equivalent of several, of, of $100,000 or more in today's dollars, if you adjust for inflation, S significant money per year, to organize uh, basically a think tank. There was a public outreach. They were, they were giving lectures in some of the local community colleges. Some of them wrote a physics opera about the new ideas about quantum theory in the brain to be staged in a park in the Bay Area. Uh, they wrote pamphlets. They gave lectures. They were very active. And they were bankrolled not by sort of tenure-track positions at a major university, but in fact very handsomely by people like Werner Erhard. Uh, Earhart introduced him to, if you'd like, the other main figure in his human potential movement in California, a person named Michael Murphy, who was the co-director of uh, a place called the Esalen Institute. Um, MIT, uh, I often get in trouble if I say this, MIT's not known always for being the most beautiful campus uh, on the planet, although we've made some improvements. Uh, the next lecture we should have should be at the Esalen Institute. It's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous, nestled in the hills about 150 miles south of San Francisco on, on the coast. 
This had been founded in 1962. Since that moment, it had been, if you'd like, an incubator, ground zero for all things new age and hippie and counterculture. This is where the cutting edge thoughts about Eastern mysticism uh, or yoga or vegetarianism, which today sound very mundane, were then quite, quite exotic. That's where these things were worked out, as well as, uh, for example, the mind-opening potentialities of psychedelic drugs, LSD and mushrooms. Uh, and this is where my physicists gathered for a month-long session, January of 1976, on physics and consciousness. So Earhart put them in touch with Michael Murphy. Murphy said, that's also exactly what I was looking for. This is how we'll unlock the powers of mind. They advertised for it uh, in the catalog that year. It says, perhaps a new kind of inspired physicist experienced in the yogic modes of perception must emerge to comprehend the further reaches of matter, space, and time. And for a modest fee, you can go find out for yourself. So Jack Sarfati was the sort of intellectual director of this uh, first session. He went around trying to line up speakers. Many members of that Berkeley group, of course, were speakers. He wanted to get outside speakers, too. He wrote a wonderful letter to uh, Caltech's Richard Feynman. I should say MIT's Richard Feynman. He's been an undergraduate here, of course. But at this point, uh, really at the top of his career, um, already a Nobel laureate, uh, really renowned and, and astonishingly impressive physicist, Richard Feynman. And Sarfati uh, looked up to, to Feynman as, as sort of almost all physicists did. He said, won't you please come? We know you're interested in, in sort of foundations of quantum mechanics. Won't you please come? And Feynman wrote a classic Feynman letter. It says, due to the fact that my doctor tells me I have effectively high blood pressure, I think it best that I do not attend because I know I would get uh, involved in arguments. P.S. That's funny. He, so he declines. A few years later, Feynman himself was going to Esalen, organizing his own, if you like, rival workshops on quantum theory and reality, complete with uh, bongo drumming and, and naked hobtubbing, for which Esalen was famous. And those of you who know Feynman's memoirs will know Feynman talks very, oh, he had a great time. He thought this was the greatest thing in the world. And in fact, he was kind of the late one to get there. Jack uh, Sarfati and uh, Fred Allen Wolf and this Berkeley group were, in fact, the first ones in there. And Michael Murphy was only too happy to have them. Some of you might know the book called The Dancing Wooly Masters, written by Gary Zukov, uh, a major award-winning book, won the American, uh, American Book Award, still in, press, in print today. This came out in 1979. Zukov had been roommates of Jack Sarfati's in North Beach, uh, San Francisco, a kind of hippie enclave in San Francisco. Uh, he had been a regular participant in those Berkeley-based fundamental physics group discussions. And Jack said, sure, come on down to Esalen. If you go back to your copy of the book, and you, you don't have to admit it, but I know you have a copy of the book in the attic. Go back and see the first chapter is called Big Thoughts at Big Sur. Uh, Esalen's in Big Sur, California. This is all about what, the, the, what amazing, ridiculous, crazy things Gary Zukov learned during that first month-long Esalen workshop. The whole book is organized around the new, exciting developments coming out of this fundamental physics group and the physics consciousness research group and now being hosted at places like Esalen. Here's a, uh, one of my favorite photographs, uh, the Berkeley physicist uh, Henry Stapp, who was just about the only member of the fundamental physics group who had, a, if you like, a regular steady physics job. He was actually a very senior staff scientist on staff at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and had, for various reasons, had become interested in these kind of philosophical questions of consciousness, quantum theory, and perhaps the paranormal. He had an open mind. If not, a, he was a skeptic, but he listened about it. So he was a regular lecturer at these Elson workshops. P.S. This place, Esalen, which is, which is world famous for harboring all things countercultural New Age and hippie, the single longest running lecture series or workshop series in the place's history was on Bell's theorem and quantum mechanics. It was this, this group, which then was held annually with very few gaps uh, for, for well over a decade. And that's where people would go, sometimes physicists from Europe who couldn't get kind of discussion partners on Bell's theorem either. They would fly over from Paris or from Heidelberg get naked in the hot tubs, at least according to legend, and talk about Bell's theorem uh, and its uh, perhaps wider implications. So it's one thing to talk about this new set of ideas in, in the hot tubs or around the, the seminar discussion table at Berkeley Laboratory. How do you get the word out beyond this very immediate Bay Area locale? That was, uh, physicists would say, non-trivial. Uh, the, the main workhorse of a journal, our much beloved physical review, uh, had literally banned articles on the philosophy or interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a formal ban. The longtime editor, Sam Gouchmitt, uh, a, a great physicist and a great editor, he had no patience for these things. Not, not just the Yuri Geller stuff, even for things that Niels Bohr himself had published on in the Physical Review in earlier years. He drew up a special sheet of instructions for referees. If a paper looked like it might sort of smell the wrong way, this looks like it's too philosophical, he would send it out for review with this extra special sheet of referee instruction saying, feel free to reject this, well, uh, hands down. No need to just justify it. Tell me if it falls in this category. That's how formal the ban was uh, into the, the early and mid-1970s at the Physical Review. Uh, 
So this new material got shunted into rather unusual forums. One of them was a kind of underground uh, newsletter, mimeographed, hand-typed and mimeographed, circulated by a Swiss-based uh, foundation. The letter is called Epistemological Letters. This is where John Bell had to publish some of his follow-ups on Bell's theorem, right, into the early and mid-1970s. Some of those articles were later republished when Bell's theorem became a big deal and physicists were embarrassed. They had to put it in this... Uh, this sort of trashy newsletter, but that's where Bell had to publish some of his work, some very uh, renowned physicists and philosophers, and in some instances, uh, members of this uh, discussion group. So in one sense, they kind of do an end run around the, the standard peer-reviewed articles. Again, like with their hunt for patrons, they're even more effective and more creative. Uh, instead of even worrying about that Swiss newsletter, they found their own mouthpiece in this gentleman here named Ira Einhorn. As you may know, Einhorn in German means uh, unicorn, one horn. He often called himself the unicorn. Again, if I were giving this talk in 1970, I'd have more hair, but anyway, um, it would be a long time ago. Uh, we'd all know who Ira Einhorn was. He was a, a world, certainly national famous, in some sense world famous, uh, leader of the anti-war protests. He was one uh, with people like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. He would help organize these massive rallies uh, at the Pentagon in the era of the Vietnam War. He became an early environmental activist. He actually helped uh, organized, it's, it's, it's contentious it, how much help he gave, but he certainly was part of the organization for the very first Earth Day rally just 40 years ago this month in 1970 in Philadelphia. And he had developed by the early 1970s a real interest, a passion in basically science, quantum theory in particular, and the paranormal. He read about the early accounts of Yuri Geller. He, in fact, he, he became one of Geller's behind the scenes handlers. He helped arrange some of these laboratory tests. He helped get books about Yuri Geller into print. He had contacts in the New York publishing world. Uh, and he decided to do for himself what the physical review wouldn't do. He ran a, a preprint service. He had a, an unusual arrangement with Bell Telephone of Philadelphia, of Pennsylvania, based in Philadelphia. Uh, again, details would take too long to divulge in full, but I'd be happy to talk about it later. The upshot was he gave basically free management consulting. This, I, I should say, he was a, a dropout graduate student from uh, Penn's English department who suddenly grew his hair long, got a large belly, was uh, involved in uh, the psychedelic scene and anti-war protests, and the ex corporate executives of Bell Telephone sought this person out avidly. They would wine and dine him for weeks and weeks, and indeed it turned out for years, because he would tell them how to connect with the people of Philadelphia. He was seen as sort of the local hero for many of these folks. Uh, he was what we now call a community organizer. Uh, and in, in return, he never got a penny in compensation. Instead, he said, here's what you'll do for me. I will send you stacks of papers. You will pay for the photocopying, the distribution, and mail them out to a list of people whose addresses I will provide. This became known as the Unicorn Preprint Service. Uh, so these envelopes would appear uninvited. People didn't ask to be put on the Einhorn's list. He thought, you were interesting. Here, take this stuff, like it or not. Uh, including many very prominent physicists who, who weren't particularly interested in this stuff. And so it's a wide-ranging list. So people like uh, Freeman Dyson and John Wheeler were on this list alongside, and also Tom Kuhn, that's Thomas Kuhn, author of The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, arguably the, the single most influential uh, historian and philosopher of science in the 20th century, that Tom Kuhn. But also Andrzej Jabuharic, who was Yuri Geller's main handler, uh, Gerald Feinberg, Columbia Department, Physics Department Chair. It, it's, it's a wide-ranging mix. Nick Herbert, who's one of the members of that uh, Berkeley Fundamental Physics Group. He's circulating, in this case, a preprint by Jack Sarfati and Fred Allen Wolf, two of those core members. Uh, the title you can't read, it says, a, uh, oh, I can't read either, a Dirac equation description of a quantized care space-time. Now, some of the room will recognize that as a perfectly ordinary, in fact, even mundane topic for a physics article. In case you missed it, someone wrote in uh, by hand, see pages four and five on the psi effect, right? They were trying to extend parapsychology even to cosmology. And this would circulate uh, thanks to Einhorn's very avid decade-long preprint service. So they again could do an end run around the kind of traditional peer-reviewed normal ways in which physicists would get this kind of work into circulation. They had their own parallel universe, if you'd like. That worked until Einhorn was uh, arrested for uh, on charges of their quite brutal murder of his girlfriend in 1979. Uh, P.S. He skipped town uh, before the trial, was living under assumed names in Europe for almost 20 years before the FBI and Interpol caught him. So this was a really creative alternate route, and, but it was also very shaky, right? They created a parallel universe that was fragile. They, they, could, they had to rely on people like Einhorn, who for a bit better or a decade were a great way of getting the word out, but that wasn't the same as having something like the power of the physical review behind you where you know you have some confidence it'll be there long term. Nonetheless, before the quite grisly murder and, and, uh, and his fleeing, he, by the way, I should say Einhorn was, was finally extradited after a long 
hoo-ha, and he's now serving a, a, life, uh, a lifetime sentence in a federal prison in Pennsylvania. But he was on the lam for almost 20 years. Before all that, Einhorn, whom I mentioned, had very strong connections to the New York publishing world. He was effectively a kind of un unofficial associate editor for some of the largest popular presses in New York. And he's the one who started getting this new wave of books, many of which are in our attics or basements today. The first of them was from 1974. The agent was Ira Einhorn. The authors were Jack Sarfati, Fred Allen Wolf, and one of Fred's friends from high school, a writer named Bob Tobin. It's called, innocuously enough, Space, Time, and Beyond. This is a marvelous book. It's basically cartoons by the friend Tobin, uh, about really whimsical cartoons about trying to explain what they call the Geller effect, Yuri Geller and parapsychology, with actually incredibly dense technical footnotes and appendices about quantum theory and Bell's theorem written by Sarfati and Wolf. So it was this kind of cartoon with hardcore appendices about uh, quantum theory and psi. And then, I, I won't go through the whole list, but basically all these books, except for Persig's, all these books had some direct connection to this Berkeley group, either because they were the authors, or they were the consultants, or they wrote the epilogue. Or they, these were the, the books that, that helped to define a whole new genre. They sold obnoxiously well. These became literally a time and time again bestsellers. They were, and I'll talk about the reviews in a moment. So before, Geller, uh, before uh, Einhorn had his troubles, or his girlfriend had his troubles, had her troubles. Uh, he, Einhorn was remarkably successful in really inventing almost whole cloth in res a resurgence of popular publishing interest in what we would now call quantum theory, but also these kind of wider applications, most of them paranormal or, or Eastern mystical or something like that. Uh, this was a, a, a runaway phenomenal success. I'm now at the last part of the lecture, and very briefly, I want to talk about an ex a sort of potted case history, an example of that kind of activity in a book, again, which I think hopefully is familiar to many of us. I, I quite loved this book uh, as a younger uh, student. Uh, a book by Fritjof Copper called The Tao of Physics. Uh, Copper was a member of this Berkeley group. Uh, he was a, a postdoc in particle theory at UC Santa Cruz in the late 60s. His visa ran out. He couldn't get a job. He had to return to Europe. Uh, and while there, while completely out of work, he started writing uh, this book. Turns out he had a desk, no, no fellowship, no money, but he got a desk at the London-based Imperial College, and that's where he set to work. He came back to Berkeley just as the book was being published in 1975. So he was desperate for money. He had, uh, there's an extensive correspondence to, to, to stow with really the hard straits he was in. He was tutoring, sort of high school level tutoring in physics and math. He was writing abstracts in his native language of German. He's originally from Vienna. Uh, he'd write abstracts of English language physics articles for the German journals I mean, for cash, you know, a, a pittance per, per abstract. And he began trying to write a textbook. He says, here's a way to pull out of my spiral. Uh, he has this great passion for quantum physics. Uh, he wants to write a textbook that will both uh, help pay the bills, he'll get royalties, maybe even an advance from a publisher, and also, he hoped, that would help him look like a more competitive candidate on the job market. Look, I'm a really dedicated teacher. I wrote this whole textbook on quantum physics. It was, a, it was a reasonable idea. Drafts survived. It was called Current Concepts in Particle Physics. He sought help from one of our own. Many of you will know uh, Vicky Weisskopf, renowned, really quite eminent uh, MIT physicist. By this point uh, in his career, he's recently retired director of CERN, the humongous particle physics laboratory in, in Geneva, uh, where the LHC is today. You might have been hearing about the LHC. Uh, Weisskopf was also an accomplished popular science writer by this point, many books, and a textbook author. Uh, he, uh, also a native of uh, Austria originally, he and Copper had met at a summer school. Copper reached out to him. He began sending drafts of chapters, which are now in the MIT archives in Vicky's papers, which is marvelous. Some of the correspondence survives. And he also was hoping that, Co with, that, that uh, Weisskopf, with Weisskopf's extensive connections to publishers, textbooks, popular books, said, can you help me land a publisher? I'm, I'm desperate. These letters are very poignant that Copper is sending. Back and forth the draft, the letters fly. Uh, Copper writes a draft chapter on, say, the uncertainty principle. Weisskopf sends detailed comments back and ignores the other part of the letter from Copper, which says, by the way, I really need help here. Can you get me a publisher? Finally, uh, Weisskopf finally takes the hint. These, these are not subtle letters by, the, by this point. And he writes back to Dear Talk to Copper. I like your style and find many things well expressed. I would again encourage you to go ahead and finish the manuscript. Uh, I understand your need for financial support, which have been the, the main point of these, of these letters. But I suppose you're aware of the fact that a book like this is not going to bring in much money because of the nature of the subject. Uh, the best that one can hope is something like $1,000 the first year and less thereafter. This is, this is a, a noble enterprise, but it's a lousy get-rich-quick scheme, right? Write the textbook. You're doing a good job with it. I like these chapters, but this is not going to solve your financial problems. Around that time, uh, Copper returned for a short visit to California. He had, uh, a, must be unique in the annals of Santa Cruz, he had a transcendental experience, transcendental experience on the beach. 
Uh, he became one with the universe. He actually described it quite beautifully, quite movingly in, in the preface to, to the book. But he, he found himself sort of seeing in the vibrations of air molecules and the molecules in the sand and rocks and sea, uh, the dance of Shiva, as well as the things he learned about atomic physics or quantum wave functions. He thought, this, this is really interesting. He had independently become interested while he was in the Bay Area in the sort of blossoming uh, interest in Eastern mysticism, Zen, Tao, Buddhism, and so on. And when he makes this return trip, after Weisskopf has told him, write your textbook, but you won't get rich from it, another one of his advisors, the, the Santa Cruz Physics Department chair, says, why are you doing this to yourself? Why write a losing financial proposition when your real heart is in this Eastern mysticism stuff? Why don't you write the book combining his interests? The copper credits this physicist, Michael Nauenberg, uh, who was, shall we say, rather uh, unimpressed by the counterculture. He was not a New Age hippie by any stretch. But it's Nauenberg who says, you should do both together. Why don't you combine these things? He might have even said, duh, right? Just combine these things. So Copper, in fact, starts to do that. He starts writing brand new chapters, one each on Zen Buddhism, on Confucianism, on uh, Taoism, and starts interleaving them into the textbook chapters he's already written. And then he tries desperately to get a publisher. A London-based publisher takes a chance on it. Uh, the, the US publisher Shambhala, which off, with offices here in Cambridge, as well as in Boulder, Colorado, and Berkeley, California, a kind of Eastern mysticism niche, small publishing house. Uh, they take a chance on it. The book comes out in 75. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Fritjof meets up again with Weisskopf at a conference in California. Now they're on friendly terms. Dear Fritjof, not dear Dr. Copper, Vicky writes back. Uh, Copper gave Weisskopf a copy of the book saying, you indeed have been so influential, inspiring to me to start this whole project. I, you know, I hope you like it. And Weisskopf writes back on the, from, uh, from this encounter, I read a good part of your book during my flight back. I liked it very much. Uh, it is mu very hard for me to judge whether you have succeeded in your task, since it addresses itself to a very specific kind of public than you find here in the East. Right? Translation, we have no hippies here in MIT. Right? I don't know who your audience is. I do believe, however, that it is a good book, and there will be many people who will have a better idea of physics after they've read it. He closes the letter by saying, by the way, I hope sales will go well. In fact, they went moderately well. They went astronomically well. This hit its niche. Uh, it sold, its, its first print runs out uh, almost instantly. Within the first uh, year and a half, there were 150,000 copies sold. To give you an idea, my first book has now sold, just sold 1,200 copies. Those zeros matter at the end. Uh, and by now, it's sold multi-million copies, uh, 43 editions in 23 languages. This is what's known as a blockbuster runaway hit, the Tao of Physics. It grew out of this moment of, for an infra of, of, uh, of cracks in the infrastructure and in what it meant to try to be a physicist in those early years of the 70s. Now, uh, I, 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 I wasn't surprised the book sold well. It's, it's well written, it's interesting. Copper really knows his, his physics. Uh, he, he's a good teacher, a good pedagogue in that book. What did surprise me was the reception it received from working physicists at the time. That I didn't expect. The book, we might have thought, would be pan. This is mere sort of, you know, uh, pandering uh, popular garbage, one would have expected. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The book was held up for special praise in Physics Today, the kind of physics uh, house or organ, house journal. Uh, the reviewer, who is an astrophysicist at Cornell, not a Bay Area hippie, the reviewer says it gets the physics right, that's most important. But even more important, he says it couches this material in the immediate feeling-oriented vision of the mystic, so attractive to many of our best students. At Cornell, as at Berkeley, as at MIT, as everywhere else, the seats were running empty in physicists' classrooms. And the physicist said, here's one way to try to attract some students back, show them that we are, in fact, in tune with what students seem to be really interested in now. Uh, the American Journal of Physics, which specializes in the pedagogy, the teaching of physics, how best to design curricula or, or, uh, or innovate in, in presenting hard material. They don't debate whether to use Copper's book. There's a whole sort of Cold War escalation of how best to use the book. They all, think they, they all know they have to use it for this kind of salesmanship reason. And I say, I have a better course that I've developed around this book than you do. My book more effectively uses the Tao of Physics to get physics majors, not physics for poets, to get physics majors back in the classroom. And that goes on, in fact, for many years into the early 80s. Uh, as one of the, one of the uh, uh, authors of one of these early uh, curricula notes, that it should be emphasized most of these students would not have taken an offering in the physics department if it were not this one, meaning don't you know, back off. I'm the one getting, uh, as he put it to me in, in an email, I'm getting the bums in the seats and they're getting enrollments back. A very similar, just to make a long story short, very similar story with uh, uh, some of these follow-up books by other members of that Berkeley Collective. Nick Herbert's book, Quantum Reality, came out in 1985. When I was a grad student at Harvard, we actually used that uh, for some of our undergraduate teaching. I was the TA, uh, and that was assigned as, as a supplementary text in the mid-90s. This is, in fact, a very lovely way to learn about quantum theory, uh, published from that same, that same moment. 
Now, we might be tempted, some of us might dearly hope, that we can make a kind of clean, razor-sharp separation between all that stuff, creative, interesting, inspired as it may be, somehow that can't be real physics, one might dearly hope in one's bones. Surely there's a way to demarcate some first principles way to say, that's cool but not physics, this here is physics, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and uh, I'm here to tell you, we, I don't think we can do that. We can say there, we can certainly say there's a spectrum. These people are on, shall we say, one end of that spectrum, more, some more than others. But this is somehow not a question of, a, it's not a binary. This is not physics yes or physics no. Uh, and in, in the book, I explore some of these things. Uh, one of the ways to, to see these tethers is to look at uh, the ties of patronage. That person, Werner Erhardt, who I mentioned, of, of Est, Erhardt Seminars Training, who was v wildly generous to uh, the Berkeley group, became wildly generous for well over a decade for some exquisitely influential physicists, not just the ones who were kind of on the margins. Physicists based here at Harvard and MIT, one of whom, Sidney Coleman, uh, a renowned physicist, uh, I like to joke, among his many honors, he was one of my dissertation advisors. I don't think he saw that as an honor, but anyway, uh, someone who was here at Harvard, a, a student had been at Caltech. Uh, he became a kind of point person as did Roman Jakeef uh, here at MIT, in organizing a very successful, very elite series of very serious conferences uh, in theoretical physics, paid for by Werner Erhardt, hosted in Erhardt's house slash kind of headquarters for EST, that ran for, again, uh, the better, uh, uh, better part of a decade, perhaps uh, more than a decade, I've lost track. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing in the interest of time, but, but Coleman was very clear to say, we're getting money from this somewhat curious organization, but we're going to do good physics with it, right? Physicists had been doing that with patrons since World War II. We don't have to be dogged, hawkish militarists to get money from the Pentagon. Many of them, most of them weren't. Uh, we don't have to be long-haired uh, California New Agers to get money from Werner Erhardt to do good physics. And so it's not that the activity of this fundamental physics group in the, say, line, the patronage lines marks them as somehow other than, in fact, some of our uh, exemplary physicists uh, from, from the leading centers here. And there's more to be said about that. But one line is we can't cut them off by patronage. We also can't cut them off intellectually. And again, this will make an even longer story even shorter. I started the talk, remember, with that, those, those nods toward very recent innovations in quantum encryption. Vienna, Geneva, these real-world uh, uh, demonstrations. Uh, there is, in fact, an, a remarkably straight line. It's actually a, a, a harrowingly straight line from, if you like, my group, from members of this fundamental physics group who are trying desperately to, to work out the implications of Bell's theorem for things like mind reading, for things like long-distance connections, and just to see where does this go. No one, very few other people were paying attention to entanglement at all. And that leads to a whole series of funny uh, scatterings, encounters, uh, with what we now see is page one of our textbooks for quantum information science, something called the no cloning theorem. The fact that you can not make, arbitrary, uh, make copies of an arbitrary unknown quantum state, called the no cloning theorem, you can't just clone uh, a quantum system arbitrarily. Uh, that's what allows one to have these perfectly protected uh, encrypted signals. No one could grab onto one of those photons, in, say A and B photons in these encryption experiments. No one could grab one, make a bunch of copies, and then measure anything they wanted that because the act of trying to copy it will, in fact, uh, irre irrevocably disturb the system. Uh, it's, it, you, you can think of it as kind of akin to the uncertainty principle. It's not quite the same. That was worked out and published uh, in 1982, it was discovered independently by three different, three different groups of physicists working across the world, uh, in, uh, two in different places in Europe, one, in, uh, one group based in Texas. They were in independent of each other. They had one common cause, trying to disprove an, a, a preprint circulated by the remnants of Ira Einhorn's Unicorn preprint service, disprove the fact that you can use Bell's theorem to, do, to conduct seances with Harry Houdini. Turns out you can't. Uh, but the reason you can't, the no-go theorem, is why we can do things like ultimately protect our information uh, in, and do things like quantum encryption. And so there's a law, wonderful story about referee reports and who gets their hands on the preprint when, and I go into that in, I think, far too much detail. I was quite astonished by it. I'd be happy to talk more about it if you're interested. But the idea is, even intellectually, not just in terms of patrons, Earhart pays for both things at, uh, in, in close in time, but in fact, intellectually, the, the early adopters of Bell's theorem, the ones who cared most deeply about the implications, the metaphysical implications of entanglement in this, the heart of quantum theory. They're the ones who instigate quite directly uh, a knock-on effect like billiard balls scattering into each other. They instigate these intellectual breakthroughs in which we're still exploring today. So let me conclude. We have a standard account that I think might be common sense for most of you in the room. It, many American historians are now writing this into their, into their books about the 1970s. The standard account is that this, this long-haired, hippie, counterculture, new age thing, whatever it was, this social movement, was inherently and vehemently anti-science. That's what's been true, that, that, that argument has been articulated since that time, since 1969, right through some of our earliest, in fact, some of our otherwise best cultural histories today. 
that this weird hippie movement was trying to throw off the yoke of so-called Western rationality, trying to embrace you know, crystal healing but not modern medicine and so on. That account, I think, is, is um, the technical term again is wrongity wrong wrong. Right? Rarely in history can we say that's right or wrong. Oh, it's a matter of interpretation. That's actually just wrong. I will, I will say it very forcefully. And in fact, quantum mechanics in general, a cutting edge developments like Bell's theorem in particular, these were avidly sought after. These became intellectual anchors for some of the most influential New Age and counterculture figures in the United States for well over a decade and a half. They were paid for handsomely, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in, in, uh, in constant dollars. They were sought after, not just passively received. They wanted this stuff. They wanted the best that modern physics had to offer. They were hardly throwing off the yoke of modern physics. And this, in, in turn, this work with all its obvious successes, which are both funny and at some sometimes we might roll our eyes, this work at this moment, the crucial moment of transition of what it meant to be a young physicist in the 1970s, that work helped to bring some of this foundational work uh, back into, into the mainstream. Thank you. A question about a, a, a related, um, very, but very well, connected topic is, uh, the, a lot of the, a lot of the research is going over to CERN. Um, these big um, colliders are not being built in the U.S. Yes. Um, you know, it seemed like it was a decline. Is this like maybe a decline of science in the U.S. or is there some reason for that? Or do you have? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Sure. No. I, so uh, it, it's a very important question. It's also a very big question that I would also speak far too long on. So let me say briefly that uh, the period since. At uh, the end of the Cold War, the final end of the Cold War, uh, meaning the early 90s, say, we might mark it as approximately 1991. You can choose your favorite date, approximately 1990. Uh, the United, funding for basic science, especially basic physics in the United States, went through a similar downturn uh, in the early and mid-90s as it happened in the early 70s, actually for rather similar structural reasons. It was tied largely to sort of the changing geopolitical situation. In the early 70s, there was detente, what seemed like a kind of warming of relations with the Soviet Union. That's around the time when, say, Nixon goes to China, the, right, the, the Defense Department is, is um, changing priorities and so on. So the, the early 70s looked like something like the mid-90s sort of became. And those were good times for the world and unfortunately bad times for physics, at least financially, right? So there was a, t a period of massive uh, budget cuts uh, and in, among physicists, branch of physics, high energy physics was cut most extremely. The, the, in real dollars, funding for high energy particle physics in the United States fell 50%. So there's a way in which there are, there's spaces for um, work that can be sorted by multiple uh, patronage lines. I think of the perimeter especially, it was, it was founded with a hope for being a kind of a, a more stable home for people pursuing what, what their founders considered foundational or, or, or basic research that was being ignored or overlooked at the main centers. People can debate, was it being overlooked? Was, is that a fair characterization? But I think the perimeter folks said, we need a home for this stuff. Uh, and in fact, uh, that home has hosted people who are very famous, uh, you know, full professors in physics, as well as people who have no day job, right? Who have PhDs in physics, got PhDs right around the time of the last crunch in the early mid 90s, couldn't get jobs, uh, and have been making their way with day jobs and still dreaming big thoughts at night. It has, it has room, literally room, for both of those types of career paths and everything in between. Uh, some of those folks have, done, have created a spin off group, a kind of web based forum called, I think it's the FQXI or FXQI, I've forgotten, uh, which stands for something that basically Fundamental Questions Institute, which is basically a, a, a way of, of channeling private funding, very generous private funding, uh, for large and small projects on the interpretation of quantum theory, for example, on um, foundational questions of cosmology or quantum gravity. And, you know, so, so, that, so there are catch-alls. There are places where some of these folks might have wound up had those places existed back then. Um, the other thing has changed is that, you know, I think what counts as legitimate physics has quite frankly broadened, as you know, right, from being a physics major here. Uh, we have courses on things like uh, what does it all mean in quantum theory, we don't call them that, but we have room in the curriculum for engagement with what we would now consider foundational matters. We didn't, make, we didn't remake the entire curriculum top to bottom, but there's a, there's a recognition that we need some attention to that. We can debate, is it enough? Is it the right way? It, it, it's, a, it's a moving target. But it's not quite, I think, the same curricular situation as in that sort of Sputnik uh, era. So I think physics has changed a bit. More importantly, there, there is a, a little bit more security institutionally, funding-wise, uh, a kind of catch-all for some of these folks. I mean, one of the most famous examples, uh, New Yorker profiles, international news coverage, was uh, from a gentleman named Garrett Lisi, a PhD in physics from a, a very good program, who is basically a full-time surfer dude, and that's his description. He's a surfer. He lives in Hawaii, right? Which shows, again, he's actually really smart, right? 
get the hell out and go surf in Hawaii. Uh, and he bums around on friends' couches. He has no steady job. And he published, an, uh, or he submitted to the online physics server a very interesting article, uh, a sort of rival approach to string theory to try to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. The cognoscenti now agree it probably isn't right, but that's okay, most of what we publish isn't right, right? But he was trying to do real physics in a way that was outside the beaten path, and he was, if you'd like, found and, and kind of rescued is maybe too strong. He was, he was given space and actually given money to, to survive on by these little catch-alls that simply didn't exist, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So in that sense, I think we, we, um, the scene is, is at least a little bit different from the last time. What is your own personal interpretation of quantum mechanics, <laughs> uh, Copenhagen or many worlds or yeah. decoherence? Uh, you know, I, what I do is I acknowledge the question is actually really important. Uh, that's already, that's half, that's more than half the battle. We, we should worry about that. I do worry about it uh, at least to some degree. Um, and then the other part is to say, I mean, I can offer you my, my own favorite. We can all take our vote in the room. but. Uh, the point is it should, be a, it should be a topic of serious and ongoing research, which nowadays it is. So if I had to vote, I mean, I think it was fantastically interesting work done on decoherence, which you might you know, have heard about. I'm not sure that's the final answer. I mean, it probably isn't, right? But that's sort of just really cool stuff. In fact, done by some of the folks at the, at the end of this story, people like uh, Wojcik Zurich uh, and others, uh, and Dieter Zay. Uh, the, in fact, <laughs> thank you, this is a great question. The very first um, conference that paid any attention to decoherence at all uh, was at Esalen in the hot tubs, and Dieter Zay, who was told by his German advisor, this is garbage, you've just killed your physics career, don't waste your time on mere philosophy. The one group in, in the world, at least according to Zay's recollections, that would pay any attention was actually this group in Esalen. They flew him over, and somehow they paid for him to come over uh, for one of their annual workshops. They had read the article carefully, right? That's where you had to go for a moment, for a time, to talk about these deep questions and foundations. And nowadays, you don't only have to go to Esalen. It still might be nice to go to. Right? But now we have more range of places, like the Perimeter Institute, in fact, like MIT, lots of places where that's taken quite seriously. Our own Max Tegmark here is really a renowned expert on, on Everett's uh, many worlds interpretation. We have plenty of experts in decoherence. I mean, it's, it's now a part of real physics again, and I think that's what's most important. So I, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. So please join me again in thanking Professor uh, Heiser here for a wonderful, wonderful program.